we look in the Gospel of Matthew, and Matthew, as the Holy Ghost led him to pen this gospel down to humanity around 60, 65 AD for the church, for us to see what his goal was to convince Israel that Jesus is the Messiah, that he came, he lived, and he died for your sins so you can have eternal life. But meanwhile, you got to suck out the rules and regulations of the law, which is not easy. If you grew up in a system of right and wrong and of merit, and if you grew up to say, if you live this way, this way, this way, this way, you go to heaven, and if you do these things right, you know, bam, you're, you're good to go. There was no personal relationship with God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. There were these rules. And we're going to learn when we get to the book of Romans that it was a tutor. It was a teacher. It was a means for God to tell humanity, you can't, you can't be perfect. I know that's shocking for many of you. You can't be perfect. When you look in the mirror, you're not perfect. That's all there is to it. And so that's what the law was, and that was the hardest thing, especially the religious heat. Now, the religious heat are the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Pharisees and the Sadducees, and some of the priests, their goal was to keep their thumb on the people, you know, and, 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 and kind of control the religiosity. And Matthew is doing his best to say, here's the deal, guys. Oh, the law is done. So let me tell you about it. Let me, as I said so many times, it's the preponderance of the evidence that God is God, that Christ was God in the flesh, and that it's not the measuring scale, the balance. It's Jesus' blood. That's it. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation, that he paid it all. And so as we go through the Gospel of Matthew, what we find is, one, they try to trip Jesus up. That's not going to happen but they give it their best shot. Last we looked at the beginning of chapter 19, it says this, verse one of chapter 19. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went down into the region of Judea, east of the Jordan River. Large crowds followed him where he had healed their sick. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question, should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Jesus repeats, if you have a red letter edition Bible, it says, haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied, they record that from the beginning, beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one since they are no longer two, but one. Let no one split apart from God what God has joined together. Then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written uh, notice of divorce and send her away, they asked. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to you dingbats. Uh, but it was not what God had originally intended. You know, and I tell people, I mean, I, 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 I've sat in my office with people wanting to get a divorce, people getting divorced, people, you know, using the, throwing the D word around like it's, uh, you know, some kind of a frisbee. But the reality is God never wanted divorce. Divorce was never in his plan. Did he allow it? Yes, he did. Did he ever plan it? No. All of you who have ever been through a divorce, you never got married and said, oh, man, in a few years, this is going to go to hell in a handbasket. We're done. I'm in the five-year plan. I have never, anybody in their office has ever said that. All they have told me is they go, never thought it would happen. I never knew it was going to feel like this. I never knew this was going to affect me, my kids, like it has. Didn't see it coming. So it's, you know, you know, it's, you know, I never defined a marriage last week. And uh, maybe I should have, we're going to, we're going to move on to the next year. But I, I never defined marriage. <clears throat> and I think maybe in this day and age where intimacy is thrown around, uh, like soccer balls, um, I should define it. Because marriage was defined by intercourse. So when we get to the Gospel of John and we see 
Jesus, who is, the woman is caught in adultery, right in the middle of the act, brought to him probably naked, her probably naked, caught right in the middle of the act. And, uh, and then when he, he meets another one, he says, no, you, you probably have four or five husbands. It's because marriage, the definition, that was the def- definition. You know, we know Solomon, when, we, when you guys were here, and we went through the book of Solomon, you know, he had thousands of wives. He slept, slept with everybody. He conquered a nation, they give him a, bam, it's another wife. So it's funny, today we, we, we see that, you know, when we looked at Hebrews chapter 13, it said the marriage bed is undefiled. It's, it's because that's what the definition was. You guys, when you were here over Christmas and I taught about the birth of Christ, and the reality was, was, was that when, um, when Mary was pregnant and, and Joseph goes, man, I didn't, something's going wrong with our AV up there. We, I can hear the band playing and I don't even see them. It's like a miracle. Yeah. What'd you say? Oh, first of all, we are blessed to have you guys. We love our band. So half the people come for you. Well, maybe 90% people come to hear the band. I'm an afterthought. Anyways, so here's the deal. You guys remember that... uh, um, Joseph was very concerned. And Joseph thought to himself, you know, I'm just going to leave quietly in the shadows so as not to disgrace Mary. Remember, he's like, I'm, because I, I have no idea what happened here. And that's when God shows up to Joseph and says, oh, man, it's all, it's all good. The Holy Ghost came upon her. She's conceived the child, and the child is is going to be God's son. You're good. You understand that, you know, the the tradition of marriage was that they would actually bring out a very nasty sheet the night of their marriage to prove that the woman was a virgin. Because that was the definition of marriage. Today, uh, it, it is so cloudy. There's no commitment. It's so cloudy on what it is. Now, here's the good news, you know. God always forgives. You know, people have been doing this, doing that stuff for a long time. (laughs) Right? You're like, oh, my God, I got 20 husbands. I didn't even know it. Um, You know, so he, he, but you got to understand that was his definition. A man and a woman become one flesh. They're united into one man, Mary. That was the definition. Still God's definition. We've kind of messed it up a little bit. But do you see how crucial and how important that is? That's why God says here, because we were never, God never created us to give ourselves away to everybody. He didn't create us that way. One man, one woman. So, Moses permitted divorce. They're trying to screw him up. Let's go to verse 10. Jesus' disciples then said to him, if this is the case, you know, he said, it it is better not to marry. And uh, uh, red letter edition, not everyone can accept this statement. Jesus said, only those whom God helps. Some are born as eunuchs. Some have been made eunuchs by others. And some choose not to marry for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept let anyone accept this who can. And at the end, he says, you know, if you can abstain, great. If not, I say, if not, get married. That's the way it goes. Anyways, that was last week, a little bit about marriage. But you see what I'm saying? You know, they're trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to say, no, Jesus, you don't know it all. He's like, no, no. And, and he's, he's, Jesus is in the process of just totally breaking the mold of the law. Chapter 18, just probably days before, um, God talked to him and said, let the children come unto me. Because in 
the Middle East during this period, well, for a long period, children are just unimportant. You know, you get them, put them to work, whatever, but, you know, they didn't have soccer games. They didn't have minivans. They didn't have, like, a multiple camel van. Moms didn't run them to the soccer field, baseball field, football field, basketball court, hockey, nothing. It was in an agrarian society. They farmed, they dug, they had entrepreneurs, and, and that was it. But Jesus is breaking this whole mold. And while he's breaking the mold, he's teaching a very, very, very important lesson to humanity, to his disciples. Because earlier he said, you need to come to me as a child. You need to come to me as a child. You know, not as an adult, not as a person that think you know it all, because you know nothing. You need to have the faith of a child. Um, many of you do your best to read this on your own, to understand this on your own. Um, people call me and go, Ken, I don't understand this whole thing about heaven and hell. I don't understand this whole thing about God choosing people, knowing that some people are going to go to heaven and some people are not going to choose him, and they're going to go to hell. How could God make somebody, create somebody, say he loves them, and yet at the same time send them to an eternal separation to hell? How can a loving God do that? That does not make any sense to me. And sometimes I give really bad answers. And I, I go, you know, because there's some good good questions out there. I don't I don't doubt it. I mean, I'm a, as you guys hear me say, don't check your brains at the door. I question everything. I probably question more stuff than you question. But eventually I had to go, well, you know, is this, is this the word of God? Am I, do I have the faith of a child? Do I know all the answers? No. Did God give me free will? Yes. When he created me, when he created some people, he goes, man, this person is just going to totally reject me all the time. I mean, there was a dude in Lucifer. He was like second in charge. He was an archangel. He was second in charge. And Lucifer thought to himself, eh, I'm better than God. God said, no, you're not. Bam, gone. So let's look at uh, these verses, starting with verse 13. One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. Because they just heard earlier that Jesus likes children. And not all parents are bad. How many bad parents do we have here today? Don't anybody raise your hand. Good, thank you. Don't point at your mama. Gee, man, eat Christmas, man. I had no allowance for you this week. Holy cow. You're walking to school and you're about 20 miles away. You don't know you're a bad parent until your kids grow up. Then you look at each other and bed and go, uh, did we screw up or what? And if you're like me, you go, no, you really screwed up, babe. I was good. No, you weren't good. You weren't here. That's why I couldn't screw up. I wasn't there to screw up. You did something wrong. That's how you feel when you get old. Uh. And your kids that do good, you want to take credit, but you go, well, you really can't take that much credit. Anyways, one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. Ah, oh, can you imagine? You're the son of God. You're the Messiah. You just got done telling the disciples. You come to God like a little child. If you neglect loving children, it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the deepest abyss. 
Now, I find that very bad. But according to what Jesus said, no, that would be nothing compared to what is going to happen to you when I take toothpicks and run them up your fingernails. Oh, yeah, see, doesn't that sound worse than a millstone thrown at you? <laughs> Do you see? He's like, it, it'd be like, did you not hear what I just taught about children? So you're giving these parents a hard time for bringing their kids to me so I may bond with them, I may lay my hands on them and pray for them? Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their head and blessed them before he left. Can you imagine this? The disciples, how quick they forgot. You think these 12 dudes would be sharp with that, but no, they instantly forgot. They're like, oh, no, Jesus is busy. He's too busy. It's like, no, Jesus is not too busy. I am the son of God. I love these children. And by the way, if you haven't figured out that you need to come to me as a child, that you cannot do life without me. You got to be like a child. You have to have, to have to have this childlike faith. There is nothing you can do ever good enough. I just love you. I just love you. I just love you. All of us who have had children, we love them. When they screw up, we don't love them as much. We blame the other spouse. Now, you raised them that way, but we love them no matter what. I meet parents whose kids are incarcerated, and they go, my kid was bad, but I love them. I love my kids. When I caught my kids in lies, I actually thought it was funny. Not proud of them, but I used to say, well, good try. I shouldn't have encouraged them along those ways, you know, but I'm like, really? Do you think your mom and I, we did better than that? Try not to get caught. We love you. Right? When your kids screw up, they, you go, what are you doing? Well, we love you. And, and sometimes when the more tragic things happen to their life, it's like your heart just goes, Boom, boom, boom. Did they not know that we love them? Do they not know that our heart hurts and we still love them? When they're going down a road that is destructive, alcoholism, drug addiction, all those evil roads that they go down, choosing not to be obedient to God, but to live some immature, anyways, our hearts still beat and say, I love you. I love you. We went down and saw our daughter down in Rimrock, and we go, Megan, we love you. We love you. And, and it's funny because when they go through the foolishness of life, they go, but we don't deserve your love. And isn't that what God says to you and I? When you finally recognize who you are, we go, we don't deserve the love of God the Father through his son, Christ, God in the flesh. And God is looking at these people and he's saying, please just come to me as a child. Childlike faith that says, I can't do life without you. You know, uh, when you're a child, you don't go, oh, I wonder what I'm going to have for dinner. No, I never wondered. I just go, it's dinner time. My mom blew a whistle. Five of us showed up. We expected something, and we knew not to complain because that's all there was. We didn't get like a menu, okay, this week. We're... That was it. We just loved it. A child. We came as a child, you know. Our, our, when, when, when we were in danger, when we were in places where, you know, you would try to hold your dad's hand, but your dad's hand was, was too big, so he held your hand, you know. Because my dad was a just a little stinker. Because he used to hold my hand and swing me over a cliff. He thought that was funny. My mom did not think it was funny. 
I just figured it was a good time. I never expected for him to let me go. You know, hey, Ken, let's do this. Watch mom freak out. Woo! Hey, that was good, Dad. Let's do it again. Because he wasn't going to let me go. I was his son. I was his child. And isn't it amazing that God is teaching these professional people, a tax collector, fishermen, uh, entrepreneurs, he's saying, you need to not think of what you know. You need to know this, that I love you. I love you. Matthew's letting all of Israel know he loves you. It's not about who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a Pharisee, a Sadducee, a priest, that he loves you. And he wants you to have this relationship. Jesus was putting an end to religion. He was putting an end to the religious philosophy of the law that said this is man's made way to get to God. This is God saying, this is me coming to you. Have the faith of a child. You cannot do life without Jesus. You got to come to him as a child. I don't know how many people in this audience have ever stopped and said, I just need Jesus in my life. It's just not a matter of heaven or hell. It's a matter of Jesus being in my life. It's him restoring, healing the soul. I believe that people chase emptiness because we all have little holes in our souls and we chase things to hopefully fill those holes, but I'm telling you, here today to tell you that Jesus will fill the soul, will fill those holes. Somewhere along life, as an adult, as a young man or woman, my prayer, and I invite you to come to God as a child. Let him hold your hand. Let him, let him take you through things that you go, ooh, that was scary, but it's cool. See, that's that's being a Christ follower. You know, my my prayer as a as a pastor is always that if anybody ever is at a point in their life where they go, you know what? I have I need to say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I need to cross a line of faith. Um I need to let everybody know that I love Jesus. Um, I've done things in my life that you know, I'm not proud of. But uh, I always say there, there comes a time, whenever it is, that you go, I've got to repent. And repent means 180 degrees. I need to stop this and start this. You need to be redeemed and purified by God's love. And uh, growing up outside of Chicago, we never were let off the hook like, you know, to come to the Lord, you know, raise your hand halfway up and uh, don't let anybody see you. You know, it was always very public. It was like, okay, you want to become a Christian today? You want to save me? You're a sinner, you're a savior. You're at a point in your life where you just need to change. They used to make us walk down the aisle. And, uh, you know, you had to be a little bold. You had to be a little, like, God actually had to be working in your life because there's no way you could walk down the aisle be embarrassed. I was such a bad sinner. I used to walk down the aisle all the time. I'm like, oh my God. I think I put my trust in the Lord once a year because I, I never sure it took, you know. It didn't take that year. I need to do it again. Listen, I'll give you 30 seconds. If you would like to say, Pastor, I, I need to, I need to reconfirm my faith. I need to just put my trust in the Lord. I have you know, I'm screwed up, and uh, I, I'm not going to let you. I don't want you to walk out of here today of the Holy Spirit. And this is how you know it's the Holy Spirit. Because you know you should go through it, but you really don't want to. And I'm just saying, listen, if you need to come up here, stand up here, I'll pray with you afterwards, then, then please do so.
Yeah, you don't have to be afraid. And everybody's looking kind of a bummer. It's a tough one. Thank you, sister. Anybody else? Let's pray. Gracious Lord, um, you work in such a wonderful way. And uh, thank you for the grace you give us through your son, Jesus. And uh, Lord, as we each go our separate ways, as we uh, uh, give it our best shot to be the men and women that you want us to be this week, whatever profession you have gifted us in, may we do that 100% to give you all the glory. Uh, may we always have thankful hearts and uh, Lord may we remember that this week uh, we just need to have that faith in child that you always have our best interests in mind and you love us and that's why you died on the cross for us we love you uh, thank you for this beautiful day and uh, blessings on everybody we leave this our request at the most level playing field there is the foot of the cross we ask this in Jesus name